I'm Peter Block for ACC.org, and we're at 2020 TCT. Of course, it's virtual this year. With me is Deepak Bhatt from Boston and Kim Eagle from Michigan, both old friends. And uh, it is the end of day three, interesting trials, or at least registries kind of stuff today. And also, we're going to talk about a trial that came up yesterday that builds into day three. So, But I'm going to start not with that, but with a trial called Define Flow. Uh, Kim, you want to take that up? Define Flow is an interesting trial having to do with coronary disease. Maybe not exactly where you come from, but nonetheless, you're going to tell me about it. You know, I'm a fisherman, so I'm always interested in flow, Peter. <laughs> and this is a trial which uh, is, you know, there's, there's discordance between uh, different methods that we use to measure lesions. So if you compare a coronary flow reserve to fractional flow reserve, there can be differences in a given patient. In fact, uh, there is discordance in about 40% of patients if you define FFR as less than 0.8 and coronary flow reserve as greater than two. This particular study, Define Flow, was asking the question, if, um, if you look at patients who have FFR less than 0.8, uh, but a coronary flow reserve either less than or greater than two, are those groups uh, significantly different out and measured over a period of several years? And the answer was no. The, the FFR group with a, flow, a coronary flow of less than two versus greater than two behaved relatively similarly. And this, of course, helps us deal at least with one group where we have this discordance. It clearly highlights, for me at least, that when we measure flow in the cath lab um, with different tools, um, trying to find the right cutoffs and how we might use different tools in different patients uh, is a real science. Uh, and I enjoyed reading this particular uh, study. Yeah. You know, I, I must say that this study made me think, how often do I do coronary reserve flow in the cath lab? So I'm gonna turn to you, Deepak, do you do this routinely in your cath lab? Because I will tell you candidly, uh, we don't. And the coronary reserve is one of those things that came up early on in this whole coronary flow business, and then it disappeared when FFR came along. Deepak, your thoughts on this trial quickly, and then we'll go to the TBR registry. I think you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, everything uh, that is uh, old is new, and new is old. So CFR used to be something I did a lot of, but haven't really done much of in years, but it's making a comeback. And I think in part that's because the wires are better, the technology is easier to use. So I suspect this will be just part of our whole armamentarium where we see a lot more IFR, CFR, IVUS, OCT, just in the cat lab. We were talking about this yesterday in terms of the imaging. Now we're talking about the physiology part. And I think in the future, we'll be able to refine our interventional strategies much more so that somebody comes in with a lesion and we try to sort out, you know, is it really that 80% mid RCA that's causing their angina? Sure could be. Or is it that their microvasculature is totally shot? And even if we fix that stenosis, it'll still keep having angina. So I think we're gonna be much more effective in the cath lab with these adjunctive technologies. So I actually see growth for CFR in the future. All right, this gets a little bit technical, but uh... You know, they used 0 0.8 for FFR, and it goes back to the old first papers of FFR, where in fact, 0 0.8 was not really what they studied. They studied 0.75, and yet everyone has picked up 0 0.8. We're still in this mishmash of what's right and what's real and what we really need to learn about coronary pathophysiology rather than just pathology. Uh, we have to learn this and we have to get it right and move forward, uh, it's still a very dark and nebulous area. Well, you're right. I mean, there's been upward drift of the FFR and IFR uh, cutoffs, especially FFR, which you're right, the classic work was all 0.75. And if the FFR is below 0.75, that's a bad lesion. You know, I, I've seen relatively few of those where a person isn't having bad angina. The 0.75 to 0.8, you know, there's been that upward drift because, you know, interventionists like to treat lesions. And, you know, there's some data that supports, uh, you know, 0.8. In fact, there's a fair amount of data. But, but I think in actual clinical practice, if the FFR is less than 0.75, you can take that to the bank. That's bad yeah. angina. So are you suggesting, Deepak, that there's still an oculostenotic reflex that even goes with flow? 
Yeah, I, well, I think it's that, you know, there's confirmation bias. All physicians are guilty of it. We keep doing tests until we get the answer we want. That's what often happens. So if you really think someone's got angina and they've got a lesion that you think needs to be treated, well, oftentimes you match the modality that gives you the answer you want. And if you keep doing enough tests, you know, eventually something will jive with what you believe in the first place. I'm not going to go there. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> so, Deepak, let's move on to the TVR registry. That's a, a very interesting area. And then talk a little bit about Reflect 2, which was actually presented yesterday, which sort of dovetails into the transcatheter valve registry. I'm glad you paired those two. So yesterday was a modest size, but randomized trial of a new embolic protection device that pretty much protects all three uh, greater vessels to the brain, uh, that is the uh, innominate um, and the subclavian and the left carotid. So all those vessels are protected with this device. That's a bit different than an approved available device for embolic protection during TAVR. But the bottom line was the randomized trial didn't provide any compelling uh, knockout type evidence that embolic protection reduced any sort of important clinical events. There were some post hoc analyses looking at different uh, sizes of uh, diffusion weighted MRI images and so forth, maybe showing some effects. But the bottom line is, I, I think uh, most appropriate would be couched as a negative trial. The registry observational non randomized analysis presented today, very large in size, but not randomized really sophisticated statistics, propensity adjustment, instrumental variable analysis, lots of fancy statistics, very well done, basically show the same thing, no clinical benefit of embolic protection in the context of TAVR. So I think where both trials, though it doesn't rule it out either given the confidence intervals, but where both studies lead us to is the same place. We really need more randomized clinical trial data to nail down that embolic protection during TAVR reduces important clinical events, not just imaging events, but clinical events. Uh, otherwise, we're potentially increasing the cost and complexity of TAVR for no real good reason. So it's intuitive. I think embolic protection should make a difference, uh, but it still does need to be proved prospectively. I'm going to go back to Kim, because Kim, this, this is silly, right? Of course, embolic protection should keep you from having strokes, right? It makes no sense that it should not. And yet, nothing that so far that we could show really seems to make a clinical difference. I think, uh, like so many other things, you can see stuff go north, but it may not be clinically important. Is that important or not? Let's not go there. But as a general, you know, really good non-interventional cardiologist, why doesn't this work? What's going on? Are we missing something or is the differences relatively, are the differences relatively small and not important enough? Well, I really like this report, uh, Peter, because it, it showed, uh, first of all, that the technology is not diffusing rapidly uh, in our country. You know, I think uh, only about 12 or 13 percent of patients who are having TAVR are getting protection and the number of hospitals who are offering it is a relatively modest number. And the reason for this, of course, is the fact that it's both expensive and also potentially risky, right? So if you, if you apply another catheter to a highly atherosclerotic aorta, in addition to the TAVR catheter, then of course you have the opportunity for mischief. Um, the thing I liked about this report, however, was the notion that we're beginning to potentially see a trend that there, there could be some protection up to 20% risk reduction in selected patients. And I hope that we're doing very individualized assessment of the aorta and these three large vessels in the future, and then picking the technology that works for that anatomy. And the more we go to the individualized patient using a heart team, of course, I think the more likely we are to see benefit. Yeah, I, I agree with you. In the long run, as Deepak pointed out, we need a really good randomized trial to nail this down. Until we have that, we'll just have to, as usual, do the best we can with what we have. And I think your advice is good, Ken. Take, take a good long look at the aorta and make sure that you're not missing something and then try to individualize as best we can. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you have to individualize therapy. I, I do have to disagree with one thing you said, Peter. You, you said Kim is a really good clinical cardiologist. She is a <laughs> great 
clinical cardiologist. Check's in the mail, Deepak. Check is in the mail. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so that's it for day three. Thanks both of you for uh, reviewing all this with me. Uh, great news and important concepts. Mm -hmm.